A key Trump co-defendant today in the Georgia election case is pointing the finger at guess who? Donald Trump. Today, lawyers for one-time Trump Justice Department official Jeffrey Clark went before a judge to try to get the charges against him moved to federal court. They told the court that Trump himself directed Clark to draft a letter to Georgia state officials falsely stating that the DOJ had concerns about the 2020 election. Meanwhile, Rudy Giuliani, also a Trump co-defendant in the Georgia case, is being sued by his own lawyers for over $1.3 million in unpaid legal fees. The suit says the fees stemmed from multiple 2020 election interference investigations. Also this evening, Judge Tanya Chutkin has yet to rule on Jack Smith's request for a narrow gag order on Donald Trump. Smith cited his nearly daily attacks on social media and elsewhere. Trump reacted to that with this false claim about Jack Smith. Wants to take away my rights uh, under the First Amendment, wants to take away my right of speaking freely and openly. They want to take away my freedom because I will never let them take away your freedom. There's also news tonight about Smith's other case against the former president. ABC News reports one of Donald Trump's longtime assistants told federal investigators that Donald Trump repeatedly wrote his to-do list for her physically on White House documents that were marked classified. That is according to sources familiar with her statements. A Trump spokesperson told ABC that this information lacked proper context and relevant information, and that Donald Trump did nothing wrong. It is Climate Week here in New York City, and it arrives at a critical moment for our globe. We've endured months of extreme weather, including the hottest August on record. You know major storms all across the world are taking place and devastating wildfires. Business leaders are starting to realize that they must confront this issue, even as it gets more politicized than ever. Our next guest is a guy you would not think you'd hear from on climate. He's not an activist or a traditional scientist. He's a former Wall Street analyst, and his expertise is in managing and predicting risks. And there is no denying that climate is posing countless risks ahead. Spencer Glendon joins me. He is the co-founder of Probable Futures. I'm so glad you're here because you say the ways that we are talking and thinking about climate change are all wrong. So how should we think about it? Well, thankfully, we're at a point where most people are thinking about it in some way. But for most people, it's like a bunch of dots with a laser pointer. It's like some Al Gore and Elon Musk and polar bears and smokestacks and bad feelings. And I would say that that was sort of the way I thought about it as well, uh, better part of 10 years ago when I started digging into it. At the time, I was leading research at one of the biggest investment firms in the world. And I was just curious. Like, this doesn't come up at work. Nobody talks about it in finance. That's odd. And then I dug into the science, and what I discovered were two things. One was that the models had been incredibly predictive unlike most finance models. And two, for 12,000 years, the Earth's climate had been stable. So humans settled in 9500 BCE. I didn't know this at the time, because the climate calmed down and stayed in a narrow range. And that's why we didn't have to keep chasing the nice places. And so settlement led to civilization, which eventually led, led I guess, to MSNBC. But that long trajectory was a smooth climate that allowed us to plan. And then I realized, wait, everything is built on this stable climate. And now we're outside the band of civilization, temperature-wise. It's rising fast. And people are treating it like it's a novelty or a side issue. Why? Why are they doing that? Why is this an issue that has become so political? Look at Florida, for example. That is a state where you cannot deny they are facing the impacts of climate change, but they have a governor who says, nope, it's weather, not our problem. Why would people deny it? Well, I think there are two reasons. One is, I'm sympathetic. It's a hard thing to acknowledge that the Earth around you is changing when it seemed stable for so long. We talk about places like Florida is nice. Well, that is, is like, it actually implies the past tense, the present, and the future. California's weather is mild, also. Sort of the past tense, the present, and the future. It's upsetting to think, well, what I knew before actually is no longer true. The second reason it's politicized is because actually there's really no way of getting around the fact that it has to do with government. So if you look at Florida as an example, I actually happened to have had a conversation with Jeb Bush a few years ago, and I asked him, I said, you were the governor of a long coastal state with, that's built on porous limestone. 
uh, I wonder how you thought about climate change. And he said, oh, well, all the toilets in Florida flush into the ocean. And as the ocean goes up, it will push back on the toilets. Salt water will infiltrate the aquifers and the land. And I said, so what did you do? And he said, well, it was never anyone's number one issue, so we because did nothing. Because it's a long-term problem. I think it's partly a long-term problem, but the other is if you believe government is pointless, people who are most resistant to climate change are libertarians and nationalists, because it's clearly a collective problem. My profession, my work has all been about figuring out under what conditions markets work well and under what conditions they work poorly. And markets just are pretty sensitive creatures, but if you want to argue that they're super robust, I mean, I spent 20 years in finance. People in finance think that the rest of civilization rests on the foundation of finance, but actually finance rests on top of civilization. So is a person who denies climate change forced to address it when they can't get flood insurance or fire insurance? So it's an interesting question. Florida is, again, an interesting uh, case. So reinsurance disappeared from Florida quite a while ago. And then catastrophe markets started backing away. People don't notice these things. But now insurance is going away. And so the Floridian government is providing the market for insurance for most people in Florida. And now the Floridian government runs a reinsurance company. And so you have this argument that we want markets under all these conditions, except when things get bad, we'll have the government take over. I, I'm speaking with the CEO of one of the biggest insurers in the United States. He said to me, well, you know, when the water really comes in, we all get washed away. And I said, well, then you're not really offering insurance. You're just offering like rainy day protection. Then how do you know when businesses are taking this seriously? Because right now, when you see a company take it seriously, it gets labeled as woke. And companies aren't woke or political. They're practical and they make economic decisions. Well, so one way to think about this is where does climate change, where does climate re reside in the company? So uh, one of the largest banks in the United States reached out to me for help. And at the time, the sustainability team reported to the director of risk management, not even the risk management, actually, reputational risk management. Ah, so you're saying if you put your climate and sustainability goals in the human resources ghetto, and I say this in a nice word, in a nice way, your company's never taking it seriously. If it's viewed as a business imperative, well, then it's game on. And more than a business imperative is, uh, I compare it to information and money. So it's everywhere, it impacts every decision, and I don't know how old you are, you may remember when companies had webmasters, there was one person in charge of the internet, yes. probably for NBC at one point yes. in time. And that feels like this sweet old fashioned time when the internet wasn't everywhere. That's sort of where we are now. Companies have a sustainability officer and a couple people on the sixth floor who work with that person, but we need literacy, climate literacy across the organization, and especially in leadership and at the board level. And what's one thing for people who are watching, right, for things that aren't already baked in too late to change, what's the one thing we can change, we can do, we should pay attention to? So the first thing you should do is look around and see how dependent you are on the physical world right around you. So most of us aren't going to invent, invent fusion or, or even buy an electric car anytime soon. But let's take an example from another country. So in France, they had a heat wave that killed thousands of people. And so they made a plan, a resilience plan. The first thing on the resilience plan is during a heat wave, check in on your neighbor. It's the biggest way to avoid mortality is just check in on your neighbor. The other thing is start being aware of the physical world around you. And finance is interesting in this way, which is it didn't used to be, but it's become just two dimensional. It's just on screens. The last 45 years were the easiest time in human history to make money. And as a result, the world sort of got pushed aside. Finance is done in offices that are sort of like spaceships. And it's not really attached to the physical world. And so reacquainting with the physical world can be a pretty grounding experience and is a form of resilience. And I guess my takeaway from your remarks are people just need to care more. Pay attention. Pay attention and care. Spencer, thank you so much. We love to follow the money on this program and every night try to make us all better and smarter. Well, this is a distressing story, but it is an important one, and it's about hospice. The need for hospice care has been growing in this country, and it has become a very big business. When there are big profits, unfortunately, there will be people following behind trying to take advantage of those at a very, very vulnerable time. 
Tonight, the fleecing of America is following the fraud against taxpayers and exposing the people harming the patients they are supposed to be caring for at the most difficult time in their lives. Watch this. You're looking at undercover video of a doctor accepting kickbacks for referring patients to hospice care. Patients who don't need it. We're expecting a lot more than that. Tengo 25. But doc, you need help to get some patients in the door. What more do you want? If I give you nine patients, what the f you want? You know how much I can get from somebody else from, for 25, for, for nine patients? 250 bucks a piece. This video from 2017 was part of an investigation prosecuted by the Department of Justice into Merida Healthcare in South Texas that ended in several guilty verdicts. This was the largest criminal hospice fraud case ever prosecuted by the Department of Justice. Corporate executives looted our Medicare trust fund for over $124 million. Rodney Mesquias and Henry McKinnis ran Merida. Over 10 years, they submitted more than 47,000 false claims to Medicare for more than 9,000 patients. Around three quarters didn't qualify for hospice. With taxpayer money, prosecutors say Mesquias bought expensive cars, jewelry, and clothing, season tickets to the San Antonio Spurs, and lavish trips to Las Vegas. Worse than that, they lied. They lied to patients, patients with Alzheimer's, patients with dementia, they put them on services they didn't need, risking their health. Both men were convicted of health care fraud and sent to prison. Mesquias ordered to pay Medicare back $120 million. We all want hospice to work the way it's supposed to. And when it doesn't, it can have real human costs and real financial costs. Medicare's watchdog has raised concerns about hospice care as hospice has become big business. Medicare spends $23 billion, up from $3 billion in 2000. And most providers are owned by for-profit companies who make three times more than not-for-profits. Hospices are paid by Medicare every day the patient is in care, from the day that they elect hospice care. So that's seven days a week, including weekends. And that's regardless of the, the quantity or quality of services provided. For years, federal and state agencies have warned about problems, from quality of care to limited services to fraud. In 2019, the inspector general found more than 80% of hospices had at least one deficiency and 20% a serious one. The California state auditor described one building having more than 150 hospice and home health agencies, something not possible for a building that size. The state now has a moratorium on new hospices. I told her that as long as I could, she would never be in a nursing home, that I would take care of her. Judy Venable Grogan retired early to care for her 95-year-old mother. She hired Novus Healthcare Services in Dallas for hospice. But over time, she says they received less care. We kept pushing and pushing for a doctor to come visit mother, but no doctor ever came. She did get medications for her mother, but from the company's CEO, who was not a doctor, but used pre-signed prescriptions. What kind of medicine was she taking? Was she comfortable? Oh, well, yes, they kept her very comfortable. They turned her into a drug addict, actually. Um, she was on a fentanyl patch. She took hydromorphone. Worried, Judy changed providers and wrote her senator asking for an investigation. Turns out officials were looking into the company for over $60 million in fraud, including submitting claims for services never provided and paying kickbacks to doctors. 13 people pleaded guilty or were convicted. What happened when the new company took over? What happened to your mother's health? Within 24 to 48 hours after being given the appropriate antibiotic for her diarrhea, it went away. I would say within two to three weeks, she began to become my mother again. We got to have really good conversations. We got to have a relationship of his mother to daughter again. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services told NBC News ensuring patient safety and access to quality care is a top concern and that effective oversight and enforcement are important, especially when it comes to end-of-life care. In recent months, it visited over 7,000 hospices and said it could drop several hundred from Medicare.
It also increased oversight of new providers in California, Nevada, Arizona, and Texas. And Medicare is piloting a program to review hospice claims to check if patients are eligible. Organizations that represent hospice providers have already proposed 34 recommendations to improve care and target fraud. Half have already been acted on. Our hope is that they will keep any of those bad actors from entering and any that might have already entered that they will be um, addressed and not allowed to continue. For families making the difficult decision about hospice. If you have a patient who you love and you're caring for and the, and the hospice company is not following your instructions and they're pushing back, don't let them. You have your rights and don't let them make you think the problem is you. For Judy. Finding the right hospice provider gave her mother dignity when she passed. Was she at peace and, in the end? Oh, goodness, yes. Yes, in the very end, it was exactly like she wanted. The nurse told me to come in the room, and I did, and I approached the bedside. And mother was looking straight at me, and I took her hand. And she went, oh, and was gone like that. She was looking straight at my face, and I know who she saw when she said, oh. And it was really a beautiful way to see someone pass away. Now, the overwhelming majority of people that work in hospice care are truly angels among us. And it is distressing that any bad actors have infiltrated this essential system and as distressing as this story is to share, it's important that we share it, that the Department of Justice stops it. The last thing before we go tonight, dude, where's my F-35? After a truly extraordinary search for a missing fighter jet, that is right, a missing fighter jet, we are getting word tonight that debris has been found about two miles north of Joint Base Charleston in South Carolina. The jet disappeared after the pilot safely, safely was ejected from the aircraft for undisclosed reasons yesterday. Our friend Courtney Kuby has a closer look at this truly unusual search. Tonight, a mystery unfolding in South Carolina after an F-35 fighter jet disappeared. And now all marine aircraft are grounded. The jet was flying near Charleston, South Carolina Sunday when the military says it experienced a mishap, but is not providing any details on exactly what happened. The pilot ejected safely and was taken to a nearby hospital. The jet, on the other hand, continued to fly and disappeared, leading Joint Base Charleston to ask the public for help finding it, tweeting, if you have any information that may help our recovery teams locate the F-35, please call the Base Defense Operations Center. Officials are focusing around two lakes north of the base near its last known location. My understanding is the transponder malfunctioned and that was an issue. We don't know why the pilot ejected. Obviously, we'll get answers to that at a later time. Tonight, Marine Corps leadership ordered all their aircraft grounded for two days in the wake of the missing F-35 and two deadly crashes last month. An F-18 crashed near San Diego, killing the pilot, and an MV-22 Osprey went down in Australia, killing three Marines on board. The F-35 stealth fighter jet is the Pentagon's most expensive weapon system with a whopping $100 million price tag. Its ability to hide put to the test as search and recovery continues. That is a stealthy jet.